Good morning. Last night, my family and I spent some time at the Enlos house having dinner with quite a few people from the congregation, some of the elders, some deacons, and some other individuals. And we were sitting around talking after we finished eating, all a bunch of us gathered around one table. And as we were chatting, people were asking me questions, asking my wife questions. And as we talked, we shared with them that I had ministered in Knoxville for eight years and that we had been in Mount Vernon, as Gary mentioned, for 10 years. And as we talked a little bit further, it came up a conversation that my wife and I had just celebrated our 21st wedding anniversary. And it wasn't too long after that. And it's usually at that point of conversation that people start looking at me a little bit funny because they start adding up all those years. And I think about that point, one of the people kind of paused the conversation. He said, all right, so you worked here for 10 years. You worked here for eight years. You've been married 21 years. And I didn't let him finish the question because I knew what he was going to ask. I, 43. So I told him, I'm 43. <laughs> it, it, just to get it off the table, you don't have to ask me. I'm telling you right now, I'm 43. <laughs> now you have something that you can ask me a different question now. We are glad to be here this morning. We enjoyed last night getting to meet some of the members, and, and I pray that we'll get to talk with you all and, and get to meet some of you this morning. Winston Churchill is credited with saying that history is written by the victors. And there's some people who dispute that attribution to him. But whether or not he said it, it, it does reflect, I think, something that we believe in our society, that people with power people with influence, the people who are victors, are ones who influence the course of events in our society. And to, I think, help support that point, we can think about some of the other sayings that we have that are part of our culture that point to that same understanding about power and influence. Some of the other phrases that we use or that we're familiar with would be things like, to the victor go the spoils, or winner takes all. Those are statements that reflect a common understanding in our world, that power, influence, and success are determining factors for those that control the directions of things in our society. And that's widely accepted. In fact, if you think about the agendas parents have for their children, in my experiences, as both a parent and talking with people who have children, most people want for their kids the kinds of experiences that will lead them into a life where they can enjoy those kind of benefits. But when we look at Jesus, we find a very stark contrast to those assumptions that we have about power and influence. In Jesus, we find a challenge because he taught that he came for the purpose of suffering and dying, and that all those who follow him have to consider his purpose and its meaning for their lives. So considering the challenge that's a part of Jesus' identity and Jesus' ministry, I want us to take a few minutes this morning and look at Mark's gospel and trace a few things through his gospel to help us think about what Jesus' life, with its focus, as he talks about, on suffering and dying has to do with our lives today. Before we do that, however, let's take a moment and pray together. Father, we're very glad that you have allowed us to gather together this morning to share our love for you and our love for Jesus and our love for the Bibles. We pray that as we take some time now that you'll guide us into a deeper, richer understanding of your word. That you help us to better understand Jesus and how our lives can reflect his life and his values. We pray that you'll continue to be patient with us, continue to forgive us and guide us, and that you'll help us to be patient and forgiving with everyone around us. We pray all this through Jesus. Amen. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and open to Mark chapter 1. We're going to spend our time in Mark's gospel this morning. And Mark's gospel begins in a way that probably sounds very familiar to a lot of us. Mark chapter 1. In verse 1, Mark writes, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And it sounds like something we've probably heard a whole lot. Very, very familiar to us. But for Jesus' society, this would have been a very startling statement. For Mark's audience, this would have been one of those statements that would have captured 
everyone's attention because he was declaring at the very beginning of his book that Jesus is the anticipated king promised by God who's coming into the world to rule over the kingdom God promised to establish. It's a bold declaration that at the beginning of Mark's gospel announces his intentions for his record of Jesus' life and teachings. And if we drop down to verse 14 and 15, he continues the same theme as he records Jesus' emphasis in his teaching. If you tried to sum up, summarize Jesus' message, the focus of his ministry, Mark does it here for you in verse 14 of Mark chapter 1. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe in the gospel. That phrase, the time is fulfilled, is his way of indicating to his audience those things they had been waiting for, those promises that were part of God's prophets in the Old Testament, that looked forward to the Messiah, the anointed king, are coming into reality now. And in conjunction with the fulfillment of those promises, we have the arrival of the kingdom of God. It's breaking into the world. This is a really important and dramatic way that Mark begins his message of Jesus and Jesus' ministry. Now, that should cause us to ask ourselves a couple questions. First question that we should ask ourselves is what would Mark's audience have understood by this message? What would those listening to Jesus have understood him to mean when he announced the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand? It's important that we think a little bit about the Jewish audience that Jesus addressed. They were people who defined themselves by their identity as a nation to which God had made promises, a nation that God had entered into a special covenant relationship with. We can think, for example, in the book of Deuteronomy. Moses, near the end of his life, is addressing the second generation of Israelites, those raised in the wilderness, those he's about to pass off to Joshua, who will lead them into the land that God had promised them. And as Moses is talking to them there in Deuteronomy 7, beginning verse 6, he comments that all of the nations, all of the people in the world belong to God, but that he had especially chosen the Israelites. They were his treasured possession. And he didn't choose them because they were strong or because they were successful or powerful as far as nations in the world went. But rather he chose them because of the promises that he had made to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob, the patriarchs, the founders of the Israelite people. The the Jews that Jesus was speaking to were people who believed they had a special identity as a nation in the world because they enjoyed a special covenant relationship with God. And through their history as recorded in the Old Testament, we can read about that relationship that they had with God. We can read about the struggles that were part of their relationship with God. But even though they struggled in their relationship with God and there were consequences for those struggles, God remained committed to them as a people and had issued promises to them about the things that he intended to do for them because, as he mentions through Moses in Deuteronomy 7, they were his treasured possession. And so the audience that Jesus was speaking to were people who had in their mind those promises that God had issued to them as a people. Promises that especially we find quite a few in the prophets focusing on God's future intentions for the nations. For example, in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah was writing in anticipation of a captivity that God was going to send the Israelites into because of some of the struggles that they'd had. And in Isaiah chapter 9, Isaiah is looking forward past those events to a future time when there would be born to them a child who would become a king. And he describes the identity of that child as one who will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Prince of Peace. And God would give to this child a kingdom that would last forever. And that child would become a king that would reign forever. We have promises like the one in Ezekiel chapter 37, beginning verse 15. Where Ezekiel is looking forward to a similar time that Isaiah was writing about. And he describes how at that time in the future, God is going to reunite the 12 tribes that had formed the United Nation of Israel. And not only will he restore them as a people, he would give them a Davidic king that would rule over them forever. Over a kingdom of peace that he would guarantee for them. We have passages like the one in Daniel 2, where Daniel is interpreting a dream that God gave to the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar. And in this dream, Daniel tells Nebuchadnezzar that God's given you some insights into future events. That in the future, God is going to establish a kingdom that's going to defeat 
all the empires of the world. And that kingdom will grow into a kingdom that fills the whole world. And the Jews looked at all those passages, they looked at all those promises, and they were anticipating God coming to restore them as a people and as a nation in their world. And we see that, for example, in Acts chapter 1. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 6, after Jesus has been crucified, after he's been resurrected, and right before his ascension, he's with the disciples and they ask him, is it now, is now the time? Is it now that you're going to restore the kingdom of Israel? That's what they were waiting for. This is what Jesus' audience, or many of the people in Jesus' audience who are listening to his message that the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand, would have been anticipating. But a second question that we should ask ourselves, and I think a very important question, is what did Jesus mean by his message? Because if you're familiar with the stories of Jesus and the Gospels, very often his understandings were not shared by his audience. And so as we read through the Gospels and we think about the things that Jesus taught and things that Jesus did, we find this identification in the Gospels that Jesus agreed with, that he was that king coming to establish the kingdom that God announced through the prophets like Isaiah and like Ezekiel and like Daniel. But we find in Jesus' ministry indications that it wasn't the same kind of kingdom that the Jews were anticipating. For example, in John chapter 18, beginning in verse 33, Jesus is on trial. And when he's before Pilate, Pilate was trying to assess the charges that were being placed against him. And he asked him, because many of those charges revolved around his identity as a king, are you king of the Jews? And Jesus acknowledged, yeah, I'm a king, but my kingdom is not like you understand it. It's different from the kingdoms of this world. It follows a different path. It has a different order, different structure, different goals. Jesus did not merely seek the restoration of Israel as a geopolitical identity within the world. Rather, Jesus sought something far more profound. He sought the goal of reestablishing God's sovereign rule over the entire rebellious creation. Think, for example, in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 6. As Jesus is talking about prayer and he gives a prayer, a model prayer for people to follow, he mentions in in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 10 that they should be praying for God's kingdom to come. And then I think he gives us a pretty good definition of what he means. When he says God's kingdom come, he says that God's will will be done on earth the same way that it's done in heaven. That the earth will become a place where God can rule over a fully submissioned realm in the same way that he does in heaven. Paul talks about this in a little bit differently in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul is addressing Christians in the city of Corinth that were struggling with a lot of different issues and questions that they had. And one of the questions that they had revolved around the resurrection. And so in 1 Corinthians 15, he addresses that question some of them had about the resurrection from the dead. And as he's working his way through that material, listen to what he says about Jesus' resurrection and its significance, its meaning. And we find in Paul's writings this identification that he connects, that Jesus is king because he was died and resurrected, that his resurrection positioned him in a place of authority and power. We see this particularly at the end of Ephesians chapter 1. But as he's talking about Jesus' resurrection, notice what he says Jesus is seeking to do. In verse 24, 1 Corinthians 15, and then comes the end when he, Jesus, delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he's put all his enemies under his feet. And then drop down to verse 28. And when all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him who put all things in subjection under him. And this is the important phrase. This is what Jesus is working towards. This is the goal of his ministry, this is the goal that he's working towards as king, that God may be all in all. It's his agenda as the one ruling over God's kingdom to bring the world and the created order back into a proper submissive relationship with God as God intended, as we see back, for example, in Genesis 1 and 2. So Jesus had a a very different idea in his mind when he's talking about the kingdom has arrived. It was much bigger, much more ambitious than the ones the Jews were thinking about. And as we think about this agenda that Jesus announced that he was going to accomplish, the purpose for which his ministry is working towards, 
We find in Mark's gospel, Mark recording a number of passages in Mark chapters 1 through 8 that point to Jesus' authority, the miracles that he performed, the teachings that he was delivering, that substantiated his claims to be the fulfillment of those things. But we also find that there were some growing tensions between Jesus and his audience. If we think about the miracles that he was performing, and as we think about the audience that he was speaking to and their expectations, we find that Jesus' miracles didn't focus on freeing them from oppressive Roman rule. His miracles didn't focus on embellishing the grandeur of the temple and its priests. His miracles didn't focus on the religious political leadership of the Jews. Instead, his miracles focused on the poor, the diseased, the outcast, the marginalized. He focused on people nobody else gave much attention to. We find that Jesus' teachings about the kingdom, and there are a number of parables in that section in the first uh, few chapters of Mark, where he talks about the kingdom of heaven. But his descriptions about that kingdom were very different than what the Jews anticipated. He described a different population for the kingdom than they anticipated, a different focus for the kingdom than they anticipated. And those different things are part of Jesus' focus that were part of the miracles that he performed and the teachings that he gave led to a growing tension between himself and the religious establishment, the Pharisees and the scribes, for example. And as we work our way through those passages in Mark, it is leading us into a really important middle section in Mark's gospel, beginning in the latter part of chapter 8, chapter 9, and chapter 10. And this forms the heart of Mark's gospel and the thing that we really want to focus on. Because after that introduction of Jesus as the king, the one bringing God's f- promises into fulfillment and bringing God's kingdom in the world, and those teachings and those miracles that supported Jesus' identity and Jesus' mission, we get to Mark chapter 8, beginning verse 31, and we have three passages that underscore Jesus' surprising agenda. And as we think about what Jesus is doing, we find that he announced three times in Mark's gospel that he came for the purpose of suffering and dying. Listen, for example, back in Mark's gospel, Mark chapter 8, beginning in verse 31. And he began, Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. Now put yourself in his disciples' position. They're following Jesus because they believe his message that he is the Messiah, the prophesied Davidic king. But he's telling them, my agenda is going to lead me to be killed by our fellow countrymen, the priests, the religious leaders. I'm coming for the purpose of being martyred before, as they would see it, the establishment of his kingdom. He says this a second time in Mark chapter 9, beginning in verse 30. They went on their way from there and passed through Galilee, and he did not want anyone to know, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days, he'll rise again. And then notice chapter 10, verse 32, beginning. They're on the road. They're making their way to Jerusalem, where he's going to be killed. And Jesus was walking ahead of them, and they were amazed, and those who followed were afraid. And taking the twelve again, he began to tell them what was to happen to him, saying, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death, and deliver him over to the Gentiles. And they will mock him, and spit on him, and flog him, and kill him. And after three days, he'll rise again. This is Jesus' understanding of the trajectory of his ministry. These announcements at the beginning, he's the Messiah, the anointed one, the king who's going to come and bring God's promises into fulfillment. Jesus says, that's going to happen by me suffering and dying. And not only does Jesus mention his purpose in coming to suffer and die, he also three times tells the disciples and those listening what it means for them. Notice he tells them that those who follow him must lose their lives for his sake. Back in Mark chapter 8, After he tells the disciples the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests, he then turns to the disciples after a little contest with Peter. Beginning in verse 34, he called the crowd to him with his disciples and he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. Now remember, at this point he has not yet been killed He has not yet been resurrected. 
for them, the cross wouldn't have the sweet sentimentality that it has for many people in our world. For them, it would have been a symbol of the oppressive pagan power of Rome. And Jesus turns to those who are following him, many who are following him, even though it put them at odds with their communities, he says, if you want to keep following me, you have to take up your cross and lose your life for my sake. Mark chapter 9, after talking to them there about how the Son of Man is to be delivered in the hands of men, the disciples, beginning verse 33, are arguing amongst themselves about which of them is the greatest. They're arguing about position and power and authority. And which of them is going to have the most of those things in their expectations of Jesus' kingdom? And so Jesus asked them what they were discussing on the way. And they didn't want to tell Jesus that they'd been arguing about those things. And so, verse 35, he sat down and called the twelve and said to them, If anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. And then again, in chapter 10, after he talks about how he's going to be delivered by his people over to Rome and they're going to do all these terrible things to him, he talks to the disciples as they're upset over James and John's request. James and John approach Jesus and they want the same thing the disciples have been arguing about in chapter 9. They want a position of place and honor that's above that of the other disciples. And when the other disciples realized those two tried to cut them out, they were indignant in verse 41. And so Jesus called the disciples to himself and said to them, you know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the son of man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. This is the heart of Mark's gospel. This is his understanding of what Jesus was all about. Yes, he's the anointed one, the Christ, the Messiah. Yes, he came to bring fulfillment to God's promises and to establish God's kingdom in the world, but he was going to do it in a way that was radically different than the people of his world expected. He was going to do it by suffering and dying. And he was very direct with his audience in telling them that if you're going to follow me, if you're going to have a place in my kingdom, you have to approach it in the same way that I'm seeking to establish it. You have to engage my kingdom by losing your life for my sake. And this is at the heart of Jesus' upside down way of thinking about the world. And it's one that continues to be upside down in our world because our world buys into a lot of the same kind of assumptions about a power and influence and success that were part of Jesus' world. And as we think about Jesus and as we claim to be followers of Jesus, it's important that we not only think about these passages, but that we reflect on what they mean for our lives. And I think this is the heart of what it means to be a follower of Jesus, that we wrestle with the teachings in the Bible and we ask ourselves what applications they hold for our lives. Because the goal of the Bible is not merely for us to develop a body of knowledge about its facts and its places and its people and its events but that we understand why God put those things in his Bible and we use them for the purposes for which he put them there. And the goal is to make us into different people, to change our thinking and to change our behavior, to mirror those things that define Jesus' thinking and Jesus' behavior. So let's think for a few minutes some applications from this focus in Mark's gospel, his understanding of Jesus and his ministry. As we think about these applications, I think it's important we start by noticing the disciples' response to these three passages that Mark includes in his gospel. These passages where Jesus announces his purpose to suffer and die, and he calls the disciples to follow his example. We have, for example, in Mark chapter 8, 31 through 33, after Jesus there tells the disciples he's going to suffer and die, Peter pulls Jesus aside and scolds him, criticizes Jesus for talking like that. Jesus, that's crazy. You don't need to think. Don't need to talk that way. We have in the next chapter, Mark chapter 9, in verses 30 down through 32, the disciples, after hearing Jesus very plainly say to them, notice what he says, the son of man is going to be delivered to the hands of men and they will kill him. It's hard to be more clear and direct than Jesus was there. But notice the disciples' response in verse 32. They did not understand the saying and they were afraid to ask him. We have in chapter 10, as they're making their way to Jerusalem for those events to take place, the disciples, we are told, were amazed and were afraid because of what Jesus was saying and because of the growing tensions swirling around his ministry at that point. 
What we find in Mark's account of the gospels and in their response of the people to Jesus was that they struggled to understand Jesus and his teachings. And I think this points us to a very important truth. Jesus challenges our understandings about ourself and about our world. And there's an important reason for that. Because we have from the womb been indoctrinated by our world. We have in many ways learned to think according to its patterns and its values. And Jesus calls us to think differently about our world, to think differently about ourselves and our relationship to our world. And it was difficult for the disciples to make that transition or thinking, and it remains difficult for people today to make the same change in their thinking. And part of that struggle comes because it confronts our perceptions about power and identity, ones that often are shaped by the world around us. Remember those sayings we had at the beginning? History's written by the victors, the winner takes all. Those are things that point to the way our society thinks. And even though many people would look at those and they might say, think of them as kind of, well, yeah, but we know that's not how things work. At the end of the day, the pattern of our lives reflects a lot more belief in that than we might vocalize. And what we find in Jesus is a challenge to think very, very differently. And there's a really, I think, good description of this different approach to power and identity in the book of Revelation. In the book of Revelation, we have a record that John records of a vision and message that Jesus gave to him. And in Revelation chapter 5, John has been witnessing a scene, God's throne room. And he's told that God has a really important message for humanity. So important. In fact, it's written on both sides of a scroll. And there's so much they had to write down, he couldn't get it on one side. And John really wants that really important message. But there's nobody worthy enough to approach God and take the message from him and communicate it to humanity. And John's distraught. It, Revelation mentions that he was weeping loudly. He's really torn up because he understands his need for that message and his inability to access it. And while he's weeping loudly, one of the elders who's part of that throne room scene approaches John and says, listen, John, there's something else you need to know. He tells John that there's someone worthy to take the scroll, to open it and read it. Notice what he says to John in Revelation 5 and verse 5. The elder came and said to me, weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. Lion conquer, victory. Those are the kind of images we can buy into. There's a reason lions, for example, have been part of family seals and symbols of nations. It's a symbol of power, authority. And when John turns around to look for the lion, the tribe of Judah, the root of David, the conqueror, he turns around in verse 6 and he sees a lamb standing as though it had been slain. Jesus is the lion because he is the slain lamb. It's a good image to help us understand Jesus' understanding about power and identity and how very often it differs from those that are part of our world and our thinking. And as we think about this different understanding about the world and these different understandings that are part of power and identity, it prepares us to begin to think about Jesus' example of victory through defeat and the challenges that it offers to us. If we think about some of the teachings that Jesus gave that map out his expectations for those who follow him, we find him giving teachings that reflect his understanding of power and identity and that are deeply, deeply challenging, but that are at the heart of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. He, for example, taught that we are to love our enemies at the end of Mark chapter 5, 43 through 48. You've heard that it's been said Love your neighbor, but hate your enemies. But I say to you, you're to love your enemies. And he goes on to talk about how loving one's enemies means actively doing good for them, praying for them. That is a difficult teaching. That's one that you will not find nations and states pursuing. Because from our world's perspective, it doesn't make any sense. But in Jesus' life, we see it modeled. And we see him holding it out as the model, he says, those who follow him must embrace. Jesus taught that we are to lose our life in order to find it. We read a few passages from Mark's gospel where Jesus was explicit about that. A willingness to put ourselves second and embrace Jesus and his way of thinking and doing things rather than seeking to secure our own understandings and our own goals and our own agendas. Jesus also taught that we're to put others ahead of ourselves. 
Paul talks about this as he looks and reflects on Jesus' example and Jesus' teachings in the book of Philippians. Philippians chapter 2, beginning verse 3 down through verse 5, as he looks at Jesus' example and he tells his audience, in thinking about Jesus, this is what you should do. You should count the thoughts and the opinions of others as being more important than your own. He says, have this mind in yourself, which is also in Christ Jesus. That is a difficult teaching, but one that's at the heart of Jesus' example and ought to be at the heart of those who follow his example. Jesus also taught in Luke chapter 12, verse 13 down to verse 34, about the relationship he expects people to have with possessions. And he gives a really challenging standard. Sell your possessions. Give the proceeds to the poor, to charity. And that gets pretty dangerously close to home for many people in our world. But Jesus said that relationship with possessions that elevates others ahead of yourself and puts radical trust in God as we see him illustrating in places like, for example, the end of Matthew chapter 6, he said defines those who follow him. Jesus had a very different understanding about the world and about people's relationships to it and their place in it. Different understandings about power and identity. Understandings that are upside down compared to the way many people in our world think. And if we are going to be people who follow Jesus... We have to make sure that we wrestle with those difficult teachings. That like the disciples, we remain committed to him, even though it's difficult and challenging. We don't always understand how it's going to work out. Think, for example, the end of John chapter 6. Jesus issued a, a very difficult and lengthy section of teaching to the crowds that are following him there. And when he gets to the end of that section, we're told that many, most of the people that have been following him left. And turns to the disciples and says, are you going to leave me too? They said, No. Because you alone have the words of life. Where are we going to turn other than to you? It's difficult. It's challenging. But Jesus promises a life that is rich and rewarding, a life that from the outside might seem to be perplexing, but once we engage it, once we come to understand Jesus and work to model his values in our own life, it's a life of richness and blessing and transformation that allows us to live life the way God intended it to be lived to live life the way we're designed to live life. And there's a beauty and a harmony to that kind of life that's attractive to people, that's attractive to the world, and that allows us to fill our missional op- responsibility of living a ways, as Jesus talks about in Matthew 5, lights, a city set on a hill that attracts people to God. But only when we embrace the example of Jesus and follow the life that he lived and its meaning for our lives. So my challenge to you all this morning as we think about Jesus is to ask yourself whether or not your life wrestles with the challenge that he offers, whether your life is one that models that growing Christ-likeness that's to define those who follow him. It's one that begins by acknowledging our need for being like him. Uh, the message that John deliver, that Paul delivers in places like Romans 3, that we all have done things that we shouldn't do. All of us have participated in the fallenness of our world. And that creates a need that is common to all humanity. A need that's at the heart of the Bible's message. Why God had to send Jesus. And as we embrace the truth that God says about us, we're ready to begin to live a new kind of life. One that God offers to us through his grace and his mercy through Jesus. He gives us a new identity different from the one that we built for ourselves for our sinful, selfish choices. But it's one that allows us to pursue a new life only as we're given that identity through our symbolic death and resurrection and baptism, reenacting Jesus' death and Jesus' resurrection. But it calls us into a life of growing Christ-likeness. The challenge for us this morning is to ask ourselves whether that life defines us. And if not, why not? So this morning, I would encourage you, if you have a need, whatever that need might be, maybe it's a need for prayers for the church, for encouragements, for helps, for Bible study, whatever the need you have might be, you have a chance right now to let your need be known.